Thank you again, Mr. Browning. And I did forget another thing. Like I told you, I forget things. The tests are here uh, for this month, and so they'll be on the back uh, information table, so you can help yourself to those. <clears throat> so, if I said that we all, every one of us here, we need to place our complete 100% faith and trust in God the Father and Jesus Christ. Would anybody have a problem with that? <laughs> I don't think so. And I'm glad nobody said yes. <laughs> now, what if I said that all of us sitting here, we need to be aware that there are some imposters in our midst. Does that surprise anyone? Did that make us raise our eyebrows? Well, the first question, again, probably wouldn't be a problem. And I certainly hope that we all would expect to live that kind of life. But the second question, you know, that might just cause us to scratch our head a little bit. And that might, I hope it does, cause us to stop and think. Now, I'm not saying stop and judge. I'm saying stop and think. Is that imposter me or you? Think about that for a minute. There's a very, very important parable that I want to take a look at today that brings these questions right to the forefront. And in that parable, we're told very, very boldly to be aware. Now, we always think when we talk about being aware, well, we've got to be aware of the world, what's happening in the world, what's going on in the Middle East. And that is all true. But this parable says that, brethren, we have to be aware of what's going on in Portsmouth, Ohio, in Paintsville, Kentucky, wherever we attend. We have to be aware of what's going on. It's a warning. So, if you will, turn to Matthew chapter 13, and let's take a look here at the parable of the wheats and the tares. And I'll just be honest with you, I didn't give this a whole lot of thought until the feast this year. Now, maybe that surprises us. We had a lot of good conversations with a lot of people from a lot of different places across the country. And this topic, <laughs> it hit us right square between the eyes. I thought, wow, if this is going on everywhere, we need to be aware and make sure it's not going on here. Matthew chapter 13. I want to read this first, and then we're going to talk about it. So let's start here in verse 24. You know, Jesus here, he put before the crowd this parable, Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and then went his way. Think about all these little phrases that we're going to read here. But while the men slept, that's one. Keep that in mind. We'll talk about that later. His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and then he went away. We'll talk about all this. Verse 26. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. <clears throat> so the servants of the owner came, and he said to him, Sir, did you, uh, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? It's a legitimate question. But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together, and that's an interesting choice of words, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So we see this whole parable, the scenario. It's all set up now. It introduced a major, major issue. And then he gave us a little bit, of, a few clues of how to handle this. But then if you drop down to verse 36, he goes into more detail. 
Verse 36. <clears throat> then Jesus sent the multitude away, and he went into his house. And he said, Disciple, and his disciples came in, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Because it was just a little bit confusing that he didn't tell them to get rid of them right now. Get them out. He knew that spiritually speaking, that could cause division. Verse 37, he answered and he said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. We know who that is. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. We understand who that is. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend. And those who practice lawlessness, and look what it's going to do. He will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be welling, weeping in your Bible, and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. Think about that. <clears throat> this is a very strong section of Scripture. And I think that this is something that we should study uh, a whole lot deeper than we'll have even today in the next you know, 45 minutes or so. But we need to really take this and, and put it into our lives, especially in this next six months that we have up until Passover. And think about what is being said here, because there's all kinds of clues and all kinds of things that we can dig into here. This really gets our attention when we start reading this parable. It gets our attention. Among other things, it's talking about being thrown into a fiery furnace. You know what that means? That's it. That's the second death. It's over. He said, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is not very encouraging when we think about that, right? Well, it really is. Because we don't have to end up there. That does not have to be us. Nobody wants to be in that place. Especially, as we talked about just a little bit ago, children of God. Now we understand the example that Christ set for us here. And all the examples he set for us, all down through his, his earthly ministry. And we understand that we are to be living those examples. The question is, are we? And I'm not talking about 5 out of 10, 8 out of 10. Are we living all the examples that Christ set? Now, you might be thinking, well, that's a pretty big thing to be asking us. Well, do we want to be in the kingdom? I mean, that's where we follow up with that. If we decide that we're not going to live all the examples of Christ to the best of our ability, the question we have to ask is, do we want to be in the kingdom? That's really what it boils down to. Talking about gnashing of teeth, this kind of takes me back to the subject of conflicts. Um, conflicts in church, yes. You know, we, we understand conflicts in general. As a person doesn't have to look very, very hard um, <laughs> these days to discover um, this world is absolutely full of conflicts. Maybe some of the, the places that we have a little bit of comfort, whether it's at work or at school, uh, with our, our neighbors, there's conflict. There's definitely conflict between nations. Um, how about political parties? Any conflict there? <laughs> Oh, between towns, cities, again, between our neighbors. It even comes down between our families. How about conflicts between our spouses? We have conflicts. So, why would we think we as members of God's church, it would be indifferent for us? I mean, conflict in the world can be understood, right? It can be because it's Satan's world. Satan is the king. He's the God, if you will, of the world. So absolutely there's going to be conflict. But conflict in God's church, 
That's a completely different story. There is conflict between various religious sects. We have no question uh, about that. We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't question that at all. We know this. Between church leaders, between members of congregations, um, that's just to name a few. And I believe that every one of us are all well aware that conflicts are in God's church. But I also believe, uh, this is just from an outside perspective looking in, that in the Portsmouth and Paintsville congregation, I believe they're minimal. I really do. And I'm not just saying that. They're there and would be lying if we said they weren't. But I do believe they're minimal. But my question is, why should there be conflicts between God's people, God's children, God's brothers and sisters after all? Well, Jesus tells us why in this very parable. He shows us that there is conflict in this earthly kingdom. And you and I are not to be fooled by this. And so he gives us a couple of reasons you know, for this conflict. First, I think, maybe the most obvious, yet probably very rarely acknowledged, is the fact that there is an enemy. <laughs> an enemy called Satan the devil, who is absolutely there to fight against you and I as much as he possibly can. And if we've ever not paid attention to that, I know we have, but look, in the last, last month, last two months, look what's happened. And brethren, this is not the end. <laughs> There's more coming. Get on your knees and go to God. Ask for protection and guidance and deliverance. But there is an enemy, and he is got every one of us in his crosshairs. And he is fighting against God, tooth and nail. And he's trying to get, get at God, and he's trying to get at God's children. And there's no better way to do this than to cause problems in God's church, in God's house. And that's what he's trying to do. Then there's another reason, another reason for conflict. And it's because... And this is the tough one, but it's because there are false Christians in God's church. Now, I say that cautiously because I wish there wasn't. And I pray on a daily basis, and I do this, I hope you do too, that God protects all of his people. But there are. There are false Christians in God's church, in God's congregations. And these are the ones that Satan is using. And he has no problem doing that. These are the tares. Now, I'm not accusing anyone, uh, unless of course it's true, <laughs> but I'm not accusing anyone. And again, I, I say this because in years past, Satan used people. He certainly used people to get into God's church. And he did this so he caused as much disruption as possible, as much chaos as possible. And he did this so he could collapse God's church. Now we know that God will not allow his church to die. He said that. But it doesn't matter to Satan because that's his goal. He did this and he's doing it today to get as many, as many of God's children to fall as he can. That is his ultimate goal. Notice what Christ said. In Matthew chapter 7, this is a very sobering statement, <clears throat> but it's true. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. He says, not everyone, and this is coming from Christ, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. These wolves in sheep's clothing, they operate as what is known as Satan's fifth column. I didn't really understand that. So I looked that up. I thought, is that a real thing? Because I, I ran across this. And it is. It's a real thing. It's, they operate as undercover agents, if you will, in church. So these are people, or it's a group of people, 
that tend to undermine a larger group of people in that same uh, group or within that same congregation. So in other words, it's a, it's a group of people who get together and decide, I'm taking this congregation down. It's a real thing. And the thing is, these wolves in sheep's clothing, this fifth column, if you will, they cannot be separated until the end of the age, the final harvest. So here's the problem that you and I face. They will keep causing trouble. This is one of the main reasons that I have been so adamant about all of us studying, 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 and praying, praying, praying. Because if we don't have that close relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ, we stand a chance of losing our salvation. It's that simple. It's up to us. As we all know, the price of conflict, it's very, very costly. War is absolutely such a waste. So it's vitally important that every one of us here learn how to deal with this conflict because we have it. And this parable suggests three ways. So I want to cover three ways here. This first one is be perceptive. Be perceptive. We have to be perceptive of our enemy. If you look back in verse 25, Matthew 13, we already read it, but I want to touch it again. <clears throat> Matthew 25, or Matthew 13, verse 25, says, But while everybody was asleep, an enemy, and that is Satan, and all of his demons, his influence, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And then he went away. Notice he went away. This is a very sly move. He did not stay. He did not hang around and say, yes, I did that. Now, we know he did it, but he did the deed, and then he left. And what does that uh, uh, bring about? Mass confusion. He came in under cover of night, secretly, he sowed the seed, and then he left. He left everyone in confusion. He sowed the seed, the weeds, the tares, while everyone was asleep. Now, this was a common practice in both ancient and modern warfare. And they did this to destroy the enemy's crops because this would absolutely weaken and demoralize the soldiers and their families if they had <laughs> no uh, food supply. Particularly, as soldiers, according to Napoleon, if you remember that, marched on their stomachs. They needed that. That's what drove them, kept them going. You take away that, you've, for the most part, you've won the war. Now, we know that only too well with Hitler's tactics in the North Atlantic during the Second World War, one of the biggest things he did, he starved Britain. Go back and look at your history. Coupling this with the development of, of anthrax, then you have an extremely deadly situation. And that's what he did. Brethren, we must always be aware of what Satan is up to, as we cannot afford to fall asleep. And that is why the scriptures are fulfilled with the warnings to be alert over and over again. Just a couple of these to remind us. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. <clears throat> says, be alert and always keep on praying. But then he goes on to say, for all the saints, for all of God's people. Paul understood. Peter understood. They all understood that 
as time went on, people, God's people needed to come together uh, even more and more and support each other and back each other up, take care of each other. Be alert and always keep on praying for all of the saints. With the admonition here, not just to be alert, but keep praying. Look at 1 Peter 5. <clears throat> we know this one very well. We've read it several times in the last two or three months even. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. A lot of times we look at the word devour, and if you're watching a Natural Geographic show or a Discovery Channel or something, and you see a lion on the prowl, a lot of times we think, well, he's just going to maybe kill whatever he's going to kill to eat. No. <laughs> Devour doesn't always mean eat completely. It means tear apart, kill, bring down. Here, Satan is seeking whom he can kill, tear apart, bring down. And it's really for no good use to him. Now, I'm sure that we all know people that fall into this category, always leaving destruction in their wake. Satan easily embroiled the church in conflict. He does this because sometimes we as Christians, we aren't paying as close attention to his actions as we need to be. And nothing blinds our spiritual perception faster than tolerating sin. Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. Ah, we'll let that one go this time. No. We can't let the little ones go. But we do this. And so we absolutely must be aware of what's going on in the world around us. We must be aware of what's going on in our congregation, in God's church as a whole. You think about the world, and one of the easiest things, an example to go back to, is that of abortion. We all know how we feel about abortion. This is a big one. It's a huge one out there. And I know, as well as you know, that the world has 14,000 opinions on this. What Satan calls a woman's rights to choose, God calls murder. It's really that simple. What Satan calls an alternative lifestyle, God calls immoral living. And he tells us in Matthew 6, verse 8, that such people will never inherit the kingdom of God. But it is not the place of the church to condemn or execute these type of sinners. It is our place to understand and be discerning and judge. I say that from a discerning manner. But it is not our job to condemn. God will take care of that. But it, again, it's our place to call sin what it is, and it's sin, no matter how big or how small. And therefore, you and I need to help each other become repentant sinners. I mean, because we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. But when we repent and we ask God to forgive us, then He does that. It's all of our duties to help each other to support each other. We must also be aware of everything that's going on. And again, I, I said this already, but not just our local church, but the church as a whole. We have to be watching. We have to be watching. We must be aware of what's going on in the towns we live in. Um, uh, that changes on a daily basis. And uh, if we're not watching closely... And if our perception is not where it needs to be, then we may become distorted in our own thinking, our own way of living. And that is how this works. Just a little bit here, just a little bit there. If Satan can come in and just distort just a little bit, and we buy it. 
The hook is in. The hook is set. Now, what do we do? The truth is, most of us do not even know ourselves as well as we should. Now, I've been hitting this bag <laughs> for a long time, but self-examination is not just for Passover. It's a daily thing. We literally do not know ourselves as well as we should. And if you question that, wait until a major trial hits you. And then see how we do. But just to be clear, there is a big, big difference between a, a, a Christian struggling with sin and a hypocrite. <laughs> There's a big difference. Don't be the latter. <laughs> It's okay to struggle with sin because God understands that. Don't allow it to come into hypocrisy. A Christian struggling with sin will approach God and he'll say something to the effect that, you know, Father, this is a weakness in my life. I know it. And I'm truly sorry, but I need your help. And God will help. God, through his word, he truly welcomes that kind of a prayer. And he does promise to help. But on the other side of the coin, a hypocrite, however, they, they, they do not really struggle in overcoming their sin. And that's the problem. They struggle in not being caught. <laughs> and that's the thing. And even then, they will try to wiggle their way out. And they will deny it. And they will blame it on others. And they say, well, it wasn't really my fault. If so-and-so hadn't pushed me into this, then I wouldn't be here. True Christians stand up for the right thing. And if we make a mistake, that's fine. Admit it. As Dr. Phil says, own your mistakes. <laughs> own it and go on. Ask for repentance. God says, I will forgive you. Has God ever lied to you? He's never lied to me. And that's what he's saying. Own it. Ask for forgiveness. And you know what? Move forward. Put it in the past. Get rid of it. And that's what we have to do. We have to be very, very careful and be very perceptive of what's going on around us. That, that's, that's what we're saying here. <clears throat> so this moves us to our second. And it's be patient. And if you see a theme here, I have three points and the three Ps. <laughs> be patient. And interestingly, when you think about this, the, the weeds here in question, the, the tares, they were known as bearded darnel. Have you ever heard of that? I mean, you probably have if you read this. Um, if you've done any studying at all, they were called bearded darnel. And if this plant was not consumed, or if it was consumed by the human body, then it would cause dizziness. It would cause nausea. And I, 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 if you ate enough of it, you could probably do a lot of physical damage. I don't know. But also, this bearded darnel, in the Middle East climate that it was planted in, it looks almost exactly like wheat until the heads are formed. And that is why no one in the parable here had realized that there was anything wrong for a while. Not until the wheat sprouted and started maturing. And that's the key word, maturing. All of us as Christians were at different uh, you know, spiritual levels. And it's usually not until somebody's been around a while and then they either don't ask questions or they give answers that are extremely basic. Now, I'm not putting anybody down. But that's how, you, that's how these people was able to see the difference in maturity level. Makes you start asking questions, and that's fine. That's here, that's when the servants here realized that these weeds have been sown in among the tares. And that is why they wanted to pull them up immediately. I mean, you can understand the idea there and the perception behind that. But here's the thing. The owner knew that the servants couldn't tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds in their entirety. See, that's the dangerous part. If we as a, call ourselves a mature Christian, because we've been around 100 years it seems like, if we start thinking, well, so-and-so, they don't really know all the answers they might not be a real Christian, and we want to get them out, then we have a problem. 
That's exactly what's going on here. The master here was worried that they would start pulling out these younger stalks of wheat before they had a chance to mature the way they should. So he told them no. It was much safer to wait till the final harvest. That's an interesting point. Wait till the final harvest to ensure the safety of the true wheat, the true Christian. Because at the final harvest, guess who's going to make the decision? <laughs> it's not going to be us. It's going to be Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the servant here, the servants, they were ordered to be patient. Just like you and I are told, as we cannot tell the difference between a true Christian and someone who merely professes to be a true Christian, not all the time. Sometimes we can. But our human judgment, it's faulty. <laughs> now, you probably all didn't know that, did you? It's a little bit faulty. And so we absolutely have to be patient and wait for God. And they, God the Father and Jesus Christ, they will work it out. And the final sorting will be done at the final harvest. But how many times have we judged a person wrong? Think about our life, our past life. How many times have we judged a person wrong? I mean, I know I have. And about as I say it, I'm sure I probably will again. Our judgment is a bit fallible. This is why that we're told what it says in Romans 14 and verse 4. Romans 14 and verse 4. <clears throat> Look what he says here. He throws out a very bold question. He says, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Who is our master? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, our master. To him, he will judge us. And that's what we want. We might ask ourselves a question, just how well do we really know the other person spiritually? Now, physically, we may see him do some things that we don't think is right. That gets to be another whole subject. Do we talk to him about it? Well, probably. We don't want to offend, but we don't want to allow sin to go on either. But how well do we really know the other person spiritually? Do we want to be responsible for saying something or doing something to someone that might cause them to stumble? Or worse yet, might cause them to leave God's church? We're warned about that. Back up here to verse 1. Verse 1 here. Because at the same time, we, we must be aware that they don't cause or sow a discord among the brethren. Verse 1 here goes further and says, Receive one who is weak in faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. In other words, keep the right perspective. You know, be patient with them. Help them along. Help them to grow. Don't um, have a problem with little things that don't really matter. Was well, that car red or is it slightly burnt orange? It don't matter. <laughs> my, my perception of red might not be yours or burnt orange. That's not salvational. And that's what we always go back to. Is this salvational? Matters of our faith, they're salvational. Christian harmony should not depend on 100% agreement on all matters pertaining to life. Now, we need to come to 100% agreement on spiritual matters, but on physical matters, everybody has an opinion, and probably 9 out of 10 of them is right. So we, you, know, you, you pick the battles <laughs> and just be careful. You know, our motto as a Christian, we could say this, any sensuals, we have to have unity. In non-essentials, we have to have liberty or freedom. But in all things, we have to have love. So we kind of remember that. That will kind of guide us uh, it, when we're making decisions on to do or not do something to another Christian or something with another Christian. And we're reminded of, of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You don't have to turn it. I'll read it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 it simply says, 
And now abide in faith, hope, and charity, or love. But the greatest of these is love. You know what that is? That's well-being. Outgoing concern for others. That's what that is. Being patient to all men is absolutely necessary in dealing with conflict. And as I'm very, very confident that Debbie will tell you, this is the part of the sermon that I really need to hear. <laughs> so, and that's okay. But we must wait patiently for God and God's timing because when we get impatient and we start rushing through things, then that is usually when we make a royal mess out of things. And the old saying is it takes about 10 compliments to overturn one negative aspect of what we do to somebody. So, let's have patience. Let's bring us to our third and final point. But don't think we're done yet. <laughs> Which I know you didn't. <laughs> this is be prepared. Be prepared. You know, the weeds, again, that, that is the bearded Darnell. They were only able to pretend to be wheat for a long, uh, for a certain amount of time. But eventually, their true identity would be revealed. And so it is with a false Christian. After a while, they can only conceal that identity for a while. And it will come out. It will be revealed. Their true nature will come out. We know this because in Numbers 23, or 32 verse 23, we're told that their sins will find them out. And this is true for all sins. They will find us out, big or little. But in this parable here, Jesus clearly teaches us that there will be a time of judgment in which the, wheats will be, or the wheat will be clearly separated from the, the, the chaff. This means the righteous will be separated from the wicked. That's the time that's coming. And on that day, there will be, as we read earlier, weeping. This refers to emotional suffering. And there will be gnashing of teeth, which refers to physical suffering. And so we must be prepared to stand before God. That's what we're doing right now. In our Christian life, we are preparing to stand before God. And if we keep that in our minds every day, it'll make a difference. <laughs> it'll change the, even the way we are as Christians. But we're not to be afraid. And I've said many times, we will be asked one question. And that is, are we able to stand before Jesus Christ and call Him our Lord and Savior? Where's our faith? Where's our trust? Is it in Him? Is it in God the Father? It's the same question, brother, and every one of us that has been baptized has been asked. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Maybe it's been so long that we kind of forgot that question. But every one of us will ask that question. And if we went on with baptism, every one of us said yes. I hope and pray that hasn't changed. Join me in Matthew chapter 24. Verse 42. <clears throat> Just another warning we already alluded to. Chapter 40, or Mark, Matthew 24 and verse 42. says, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. In other words, we are to be prepared at all times for Christ's return or our physical death. So if I was asked the question, are we prepared today for either one of these events? Probably a lot of us would say no. Maybe all of us would say no. Our physical lives could be over the minute we walk out this door, or even before. Are we ready? What are we doing to get ready? So, are we prepared to stand before God the Father, and Jesus Christ when it comes time? Have we trusted Christ in His promise to save us from all of our sins? Have we relied on that? Are we relying on that? Turn with me now, if you will, 
to the scripture that is extremely familiar, but I want to read it. Romans 6, verse 23. Romans 6, verse 23. <clears throat> Again, we all know this. This is a memory scripture from way back in um, old worldwide. I remember it still works all, getting little cards, and this was one of them. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The thing is, wages, when you think about wages, there's something that we earn. And therefore, we deserve. <laughs> That's how that goes. We earn it and we deserve it. So, do we deserve to die and be cut off from God's presence forever because of our sin or sins? Absolutely we do. We, we have earned that. But, we have a Savior who died for us, and who died to pay that price for our sin and sins, that we may live in the presence of God forever. That's how he turned it around. But we have to be willing to be committed and stay committed. Notice verse 23 here again. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It would be a shame to waste the possibility of eternal life wouldn't it? Yet many do. They know better, but they've given it up. The gift of God is eternal life. How much does a gift cost? Well, nothing if you're on the recipient end of this. And that means that eternal life cannot be earned. We cannot work for it. All of our good and bad deeds, they're, they're nothing. We can only receive salvation through Jesus Christ. And as He was the one who suffered and died for us, He was the one who rose again from the dead. This is the plan of salvation. And He paved the way for you and I as God's children. You think about this whole thing, and, and we've probably read this a million times, and every time I read this and think about this, I still get chill bumps thinking, about how, how much does God love us? How much does Jesus Christ love us that they did this for us? Willingly. They, they set this up for you and me. We're nothing. On our own, we're nothing. But he said, I want you. I want you to be a part of my family. And then he said, I want you to be a part of my family forever, for all eternity. And this is how I'm going to do this. Because left on your own, you will sin. You will fall. and You will be the world's worst person in the world. But he said, I've got that covered if you will just do what I say. It's a pretty good gift he's given us, I think. It's a great gift. We are so blessed to be called to part of this plan, part of this family. And when we understand that Jesus Christ, by his strength, through his humility, what he did for us, we should absolutely give him charge of every aspect of our life, every day. I understand that one of the things that a wheat farmer learns early on in his plant, when harvest time comes, the real wheat has grown and has matured so much and has become so healthy and it has so much grain on it that the whole plant bows. Think about that. You're going to buy a wheat field next time. Look at a full mature wheat field and see if it's not bowed, bent over. It's just, a, just an analogy, but it's, it's really interesting. We're talking about wheat and tares here. In contrast, weeds, the tares, they never bow. They grow straight and they stand straight. They put on a facade. It's, I never really thought about that until I started reading a little bit of history here of wheat and what it was. But this is an example that Christ set for all of us. He said he, he fully bowed himself in humility. Go to Philippians chapter 2.
Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 8. It says, And being found in fashion as a man, he, and that's Christ, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even death of the cross. And this is where the strength of humility comes in with Christ. Look at verse 9. It goes on to say, Wherefore God highly exalted him, and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a, another powerful section of Scripture that I don't know if we give it the, the, the due that it needs <laughs> to, to read it and study it. Jesus Christ humbled himself, and now he is above every name that is named. Whatever it is, Jesus Christ is above it. What a wonderful Savior that you and I agreed to accept. Did you know all that when you agreed to this? I don't know if we did or not. I mean, that's the personal thing. But this is a very important parable for you and I because it reveals a slightly different aspect of the same truth that is taught in the preceding parable of the sower. Now, I'm not going to get into that parable, but in the tares here, the mixed character of the church, it culminates in the ultimate separation of what we would call religious hobbyists, or worse, <laughs> from the true saints. So now I would like to start to kind of bring all this to a conclusion. I want to summarize this parable with four relatively quick questions. First, we see this parable. We see here that there are two sowers. There's two kinds of seed. There's two harvests. One good and the other's bad. The parable of the sower depicts four kinds of soils. Again, you should go back and study that and read it. Um, but the parable here of the tares, the field, which Jesus says represents the world, in verse 24 and verse 38, contains all the soils. So, this brings me to the first summary question. What do the two sowers represent? Well, we talked about this, but I wonder this is a summary. Christ illustrates two sowers here of different character. In the parable of the sower, the sower stands for all teachers of God's truth, including Jesus Christ. Here, in this parable, the sower is exclusively Jesus Christ. He is the owner in verse 27 and verse 37 called the Son of Man. The other sower is called the enemy. The enemy, the wicked one, and the devil. And that's in verse 25, 28, and 38, and 39. This is all Matthew 13. So to describe this enemy, Jesus used the word diabolus. Diabolus. It's the accuser, the deceiver, liar, and betrayer. One who is against all that is true and righteous. That's what diabolus refers to. <clears throat> the enemy here sowed in a field that was not his, and he did this while the servants slept. Now this does not necessarily mean that the servants were not watchful and were to blame for the mixed field. The wording here implies that it was the normal time for sleep. He said it was at night. So we understand that. Satan's sly nature, though, is revealed in his choice, again, of darkness for doing his diabolical work. Also, we note that he does not bother to sow the wicked among the wicked. That wouldn't gain him anything, but he sows the wicked among the good. And these are just a couple things to be aware of, spiritually speaking. Question number two, are the tares easily distinguishable from the wheat? Well, Satan's malicious intent in sowing the tares among the wheat is to cause problems and confusion. 
Go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, look at verse 15 and 16. <clears throat> Notice what he says here. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. This is what Satan chose. The bad seed here grows to become very poisonous, becomes weeds that allow only the healthiest wheat to survive. Brother, this is why again and again and again we say, study, study, pray, know your Bible, know God's Word. Because one of these days, you and I will be tested. And it will be a test for our life. Tares, like weeds here, have never been a marketable product. Tares are actually, that darnel that we mentioned, this is a seed that is hardly identifiable from wheat until it matures. And the, the wheat goes on to produce the grain. Darnells don't eventually, but it takes time. How much damage will they do until that time is revealed? To try to destroy the darnell would mean destroying much of the wheat and separating one from the other. That would be beyond the servant's ability. Only when the wheat has matured, then the tares can be detected. Then the tares are gathered, as we read, and they get gathered together and bundled in the field and are destroyed by fire. That's a fitting end. Many who are not in the process of conversion, they resemble those who are, or they, they, uh, they resemble those who are to a certain point. And it's just like true Christians, they go to church for a while, and they pray for a while. They read their Bibles to a certain point, but they are only religious hobbyists. And Jesus calls them sons of the wicked, sons of the wicked one, Matthew 13, verse 38. And being tares, they will be destroyed. Question number three. How does this parable relate to the church? We've kind of already talked about that in part. How does this parable relate to the church? Well, this parable exposes the problem of evil intermingling with good within the church's congregations. Just as the same mix confronts nations, it confronts communities, um, even confronts homes. I believe as, as time draws closer to the return of Christ, we will certainly see more of this in God's church. And I say that, I hope I'm wrong. I want to be wrong. But I say that because Satan knows that he has a short time. And Satan is not going to quit. Satan's not going to just lay down and say, you guys win. He's going to be fighting with all his might until Christ says, into the bottomless pit. No matter how society tries to legislate or, or separate out these lawbreakers, from the rest of society, the seeds of sin and crime, they find a place to grow. And they're always going to be there. God's church is similarly affected by Satan's constant attacks. The genuine and the counterfeit wheat are always together in the church. The servant's perplexity about the sowing of the tares shows that the presence of sin is often a mystery to people. They don't see it until it's too late. Turn with me to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll look at verse 7 through 10. Starting verse 7, it says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan, 
with all power, signs, and lying wonders. This is what we have to be aware of. We have to be watching out for. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Again, is it salvational? If it is, find out, figure it out, prove it. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. They turned their back on God. They turned their back on the church. God cannot be blamed for this group of people because God does not sow evil. Satan does. James 1 verse 13 is important to remember too. I'll just read that to you. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Remember that. That's James 1.13. You know, by this parable, Christ prophesied that the church of God on the earth would be imperfect. Now, we would love to say it's a perfect place. <laughs> it's not. The spiritual church has members with the Holy Spirit who are dedicated and loyal but guess what? They have a few personal defects. Just a few. And we're working on it. But it's also, it has within it unconverted people who may recognize the truth, but are only there to enjoy the association with God's people. And maybe we have a hard time understanding that and... All we have to do is, is go back to some of the great splits. People just gave up keeping the Word of God because it's easy. It's easy to go back, not going to church, keep, not keeping the Sabbath, not paying my tithes. You know, if I don't pay my tithes, that's another 10, 20, or 30 percent I can put in my pocket. Jesus' intent is to enlighten and warn the saints of these facts not to expose the tares at this time. God will root out the bad seed when the good seed has matured. Keep that in mind. And finally, the last question here. What is expected of the good seed? What is expected of the good seed? What does God expect of us? Well, the good seed here, the wheat, the sons of the kingdom, refer to, again, baptized members of God's church in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. The saints, the elect, the righteous. It's Matthew 13, verse 43. In the previous parable, again, go back and read it. The seeds represent the word of the kingdom. That's back up in verse 19. But here, the good seed is the product of that word received. So see, we're growing. We're going a little deeper here. It's a product of the Word, understood, and it's a product of the God's Word that is obeyed. In fact, we'll go much deeper. The Son of Man, as the sower or the owner, sows only good seed. Those who are righteous due to walking worthy of God and are doing their best and are repenting when needed, living His way of life. And in doing that, they're becoming heirs and children of the kingdom of God. Just a couple of scriptures I want to look at here. First John chapter two. First John chapter two, verse six. It says that he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So in other words, don't claim it if we're not doing it. Then on back to Second John, Second John verse six says, "This is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in them, or in it. If we will, let's look at one final section of Scripture here that uh, we'll close with. This is First Thessalonians chapter two." We can read this again together. First Thessalonians chapter two, starting at verse ten. It says, You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly 
we behave ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Verse 13, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God which you heard from us, you welcome it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God and are contrary to all men." Brother, it is God's will that Jesus Christ, the very Redeemer, so His redeemed ones in this world of sin and misery for the purpose of training and testing us to help ensure each and every one of us become true, converted, committed Christians for Him and all this is preparation to enter His kingdom. What a, a great honor it is to be a part of this. The bottom line is the fact that He has placed Christians where He wants them. So sometimes we ask, what are we doing here? Or how did we end up in this trouble or trial? God has placed us where He wants us. There's a lesson. Are we learning the lessons? Christ told Peter, Again, I'm not going to turn there, but in Luke 22, verse 31, that he was the wheat and that he was going to be sifted by Satan. That is pretty strong. Has he told us that? Yeah. We're going to be sifted. All of God's saints should heed this warning to watch and pray that the field of our hearts not be sung with tares by the enemy. You know, God has bought each and every one of us with a, a very valuable price, a high price, and He's given us His Spirit, making us new creations in His time, and we become heirs of the family, and we have the potential to inherit eternal life. He expects each one of us to, to bear fruit in our corner of the, 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 the field that we're in, whatever we're doing. And he expects us to do this without any compromise. That is what he's asking us. We read this parable, and we study this parable, and it should, I hope it brings all of us a little closer to each other and a whole lot closer to God the Father and Jesus Christ.